All right, well, I tried to come up with a story. Uh, remember a story of a time that uh, I got angry and I couldn't think of one. Ha, 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 that's right. You know that's a joke, right? Making sure y'all understood that. Yeah, definitely a joke. Uh, but I did uh, come up with some stories of other people getting angry. You want to hear them? Y'all seem like to be in a good mood today, which is good. You need to be in a good mood since we're talking about anger. Uh, but there's a story of a woman who was bitten by a rabid dog, okay, a horrible thing to happen, of course, and uh, she went to the hospital, they tried to give her everything they could, and, and uh, she was a little bit older, and the doctor said, you know, listen, you, you might not make it, you might not live, you might not survive this dog bite, you might die of rabies, so he said, do you have a will, and she said, no, I, I don't have one, and he said, well, you need to start making out a will, uh, and, and to who you're going to bequeath things down to and, and, and getting your inheritance and that kind of thing. And so she sat down and took a pen out and a paper and started writing down uh, some names and everything. And the uh, doctor came back about 30 minutes later and said, well, you're still writing that will? Because she was still writing. And she says, will? No, I'm making a list of all the people I'm going to bite. <laughs> Catch it? All right, there you go. Got a clap, too. That's good. Another story about well, a man was checking his bags at the airport, and he became so angry with an employee who handled his luggage. And so for several minutes, he just belittled the young man and criticized the young man and just, you know, was all over his case. And so uh, he, he didn't seem too troubled by it, though, uh, by the fact that he was getting verbally abused by this man. And so after the angry man entered the airport, a woman approached uh, the luggage handler and, and asked him, they said, how, how can you put up with such injustice? How can you put up with someone being so mean to you like that? And the young man, the luggage handler, said, it's easy. That guy is going to New York, and I'm sending his bags to Brazil. <laughs> so, so remember that next time you, you get mad at someone who has some level of power over your things, right? So I'm sure you can relate to being angry before. We all can relate to it. We do things we shouldn't do. We get upset many times. Our angry outbursts, our anger is not directed to the people or the person who receives it. Usually it's directed to someone else in our life or something else in our life, and someone else gets the brunt of it. Well, Jesus had a lot to say about anger, and he relates it directly to murder, which we know is against the God's command. It's the sixth commandment. So today, we're, as we continue to go through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus starts to pick individual subjects and topics that we all encounter and starts to show how he himself is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law, of God's Old Testament character. He is a living fulfillment of it. So he starts out with anger in verse 21. And he says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Heavenly Father, as we continue to worship today, every single one of us in here will struggle with anger. We will struggle with anger, whether it's unforgiveness, whether it's bitterness at the world. Sometimes, Lord, we are angry at you, not rightly, but we, in our sin, we get angry at God sometimes. So, Father, we get angry at our circumstances. We get angry when things don't go our way, essentially, Father. Sometimes it's our fault, sometimes it's not. We all come in here with anger issues on some level. Lord, you take sinful anger very seriously. You give us a prescription of how to defeat it, but we know that we must not just uh, rely on our own willpower, 
We must rely on your spirit as well. And you give us the grace and your spirit and our desire to defeat it. And you will help us along the way. Lord, we love you. Lord, I pray that my, my words are your words today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as I mentioned, Jesus is systematically going through several Old Testament laws, Old Testament teachings, and is expanding on their meanings. And so the Jews of the day just thought, well, if I don't do this, if I don't do that, that I'm good with God. And, and, and he says, no, it's not about your outward works. It's not about what you've done. It's not about being good. It's more than that. It starts in the heart. It's about your heart. Sin is just not an action. Sin is a heart-driven action. This is what Jesus is getting at. And the, and the reason is, is because he says that only the pure in heart will be saved. Only the pure in heart will see God. And for that to happen, your heart must be transformed through the power of the blood of Jesus. So he says the first issue that you need to tackle is that of anger. He gives us a blueprint of how to defeat anger before it leads to our destruction. Now, anger has three forms. Uh, the first form is divine anger that God has. God has divine wrath, divine anger where he seeks to punish sin. And Jesus took all that of believers on the cross. Right? So he has this divine justice, this divine anger. Uh, second is human righteous anger. So when we see an atrocity done, uh, when we see something that the, the character of God approves of, uh, getting trampled, or we see what we would call innocent people suffering an injustice in some way, that, then that is may, maybe we'd have some human righteous anger. So if you saw a little baby being abused or something, that would make you angry because that would make God angry, right? And so that's human righteous anger. But the third form of anger is really the one that we experience the most, and that is just plain old human sinful anger. And that's what Jesus is talking about today. Human sinful anger. Most human anger is sinful, and this is what Jesus is saying. So he gives us three ways today that we can defeat this type of anger. Three ways we can defeat this type of anger. Number one, anger must be humbly acknowledged. Humbly acknowledged. We must all say to ourselves, on some level, we have an anger problem. On some level, most of us do. Uh, okay, so he says in verse 21, You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Jesus is asserting that the teaching of the law, in particular the sixth commandment, states that you should not murder. Taking someone's life. Now, it doesn't say you shouldn't kill. It says you shouldn't murder. Okay? And, and so we can talk about that in a different sermon, but that's what he says. And he says, and those who murder, like any person who breaks God's law during that time, will be liable to judgment. So verse 22, Jesus expands upon this mere act of murder by stating that those who are simply angry, they're not just but they're also guilty of breaking God's law. It's just not the murderers that have broken God's law. It's the angry people that have broken God's law. So he says, yes, murder is a sin. It is a front of God's moral law and his character, but so is anger. In fact, internal anger gives birth to the physical act of murder. Most murders, as we define them, are started in the heart, started with an anger. Okay, so I want to give you six ways. Murder starts in the heart. Really quickly, six ways murder starts in the heart through anger. Number one, when we lose our temper. Anybody ever here ever done that before? No? I don't think so. When we lose our temper, we do so because we finally had enough. You know, I have a dog. She turned 14 this week, and uh, which is old. What's 14 times 7? 90 something. Like old, right? And uh, so she is losing her mind. I've told about, talked about her before. She's going blind, and she has to go outside, and she, asks, she barks at the door and asks to go outside about, you know, 74, 75 times a day. And so about, about 70, 71, I, you know, I get fed up a little bit. I get a little angry. Like, I just, someone get the dog. Someone get the dog. That's what losing our temper does. It, it, it boils, and it boils, and it boils, and it just kind of explodes, Right? 
We've had that before. And usually the recipient of that is not the person we're angry about. That happens many times. And it happens because we're not getting our way. When I put all the children down and all four kids are down asleep, you know, ready, ready, ready to sleep, the last thing I want to do is now take care of this dog to go out again. right? You know? And so you know, and my children can't take the dog out and do their job because they're sleeping. So i got to do it. right? So that's a funny little story, but you know what I'm getting at. right? We lose our temper. Secondly, we commit murder in our hearts when we harbor grudges. Harbor grudges. For whatever reason... We perceive wrongs that people have done to us, whether it's reality or not. We put up a wall, and that wall just may never come down. And so in so doing, that person, we never forgive them. We just kind of cut them out of our life, and they are, quote, unquote, dead to us. You heard people say that before? You're dead to me, you know, kind of joking many times we'll say that. But that's really what happens. They become dead to you. You have killed them. They don't exist in your mind. That's anger. Harbor grudges. Number three, when we gossip. Now, when we murder, when we gossip, what we do is we murder people's reputation with our words to whoever we're talking to. That's, that's all it is, murdering the reputation. And it's easy to do because when we're doing it, on some level, we feel vindicated by our own lives. We well, somehow as bad as they are. That's what we think. And then we, we kind of feel victorious that we aren't struggling in that way. That's gossip. Fourth, we commit murder in our hearts by purposely neglecting others. Maybe you're someone who's always helping people, always loving them, and they sin against you, and so what you do is you just don't help them anymore. You just neglect helping them, and in so doing, you, they suffer because you're not there to help like you normally could. Right? Fifth, we, we act in spite. This is where we purposely do things to harm people purposely do it may just be a little thing and six jealousy we want what others have and so we murder them with our words we're jealous of people we murder them so those are the ways we commit murder in our hearts now we seek to destroy others through our words through our actions that's what anger does and so the 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 the, the question we ask ourselves with this is do your words build other people up or do, do they destroy other people? If you speak harshly to someone, you're seeking to destroy them. If you speak harshly about someone, you're seeking to destroy them. Now, this is most hurtful in marriages and family relationships. It's most hurtful for several reasons. One, we will say things to our spouse and our family that we will not say to anyone else. We would dare not say to anyone else. They would think we were crazy if we spoke to other people like that. What we say to our spouse and our, and our family members. It, so it's, it's hurtful, and then it's hurtful also because we will say things knowing that they will probably forgive us. They'll probably get over it eventually. And so we just, we just let loose with our tongue. We say things we should not say. And so it's most hurtful in the relationships that are closest to us. So we have to humbly acknowledge that, yes, we do have anger issues if we're going to defeat anger. But Jesus then further expands on this in verse 22 when he says, you don't just need to not be angry, you particularly don't need to be angry with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, the world is filled with mean, angry people. There are mean, angry people everywhere who are lost, who don't know Jesus, right? And we, we have to deal with them on a daily basis. We come into contact with them. All right, that's, we know that's, that's, that's life. Jesus is saying, why then are you going to treat your brother and sister in Christ the same way? If anyone should be more forgiving with you, it should be your brother and sister in Christ. And if you should be more forgiving and less angry with others, it should be your brother and sister in Christ. It's one thing for a lost person who doesn't know Jesus to be angry with you, and maybe you get upset with them, but someone who knows Jesus, Jesus says, there is no excuse for that. He says further down the verse, the word you fool or raka was a a, a semi-cuss word in Aramaic. It's like calling someone a moron or something like that. And Jesus says, "If if you call someone a name like this, he says, then you are liable to the fire of hell. Now, what is he talking about? In the Old Testament time, there was this valley named Gehenna where awful atrocities took place. 
children were sacrificed and slaughtered and all these different horrible things. It was an evil place where evil acts took place and it was just, it was just hell, essentially, right? Fires of this area. Jesus says, when you call someone this name, when you call someone any name, you're murdering their reputation, you're murdering who they are, he says, you deserve to go to that place. That's what he says. You deserve to go to that place where the atrocities of the atrocities happen. What you have done, he says, is no different than murder. So Jesus has a very strong stance on anger, especially how it relates to the family of God. Right? Secondly, Anger must be swiftly corrected. It must be swiftly corrected. Look at verse 23. Now, this is, a, this is a, a very difficult verse. I want you to prepare yourself for this. If you are offering your gift at the altar, and they remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Now, why must anger be swiftly corrected? Because Jesus says it affects our worship of God. Unresolved anger affects how you worship God. He says that if you're at worship and you're getting ready to give your offering, don't do it. In the Old Testament, you would go into the temple. They would go into the, to the section there where it was to do the sacrifices. They'd bring their animals to be sacrificed. And so when they sacrificed their animals, that was worship. That's what he's saying. Now, we don't do that. Jesus was our sacrifice. So we come and worship, worshiping God by singing and hearing God's word and by, by, by praising his name and all these kind of things. So what he's saying is when you come to worship, don't come worship me with anger in your heart. If anger in any way has led to a relationship that has been broken, it needs to be swiftly corrected or reconciled. I said stop right there and leave and you go do your part to reconcile. Now we know that it takes two people to do that. But he says you do your part. If you settle the breach between you and your brother or sister in Christ before you try to come into the worship service and settle the breach between you and God because of your anger. He says if you come in and worship me and you have anger in your heart, then you are have unrepentant sin in your life. It is going to prohibit you from worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Look at Isaiah 1. Isaiah says, God says, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices? So they were bringing all these sacrifices. They were, they were coming to worship, right? What to me is this multitude, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Jeremiah 7 says this, Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered, only to go on doing all these abominations. He says, don't live like the world, then come in here and say, praise Jesus, and then leave the same way you came in. Now, we know God gives us mercy. We know God gives us grace. And we don't have to clean ourselves up necessarily to come to worship him. What he's saying is if you have unrepentant sin in your life and you come in and try to worship me, he says, it's not going to work. You are not going to worship how you think you're going to worship. Christ-centered worship is not necessarily made better by music for you. It's not necessarily made better by nice buildings. It's not necessarily made better by praying or even preaching. It's made and it is enhanced by the relationship among God's people. You come into a church service and the people don't like each other that are in there, you can feel it. And I could preach the best sermon in the world and you're not going to worship. If you come into a church and there's unity and people are, you're going to sin against each other, that's going to happen. But there's reconciliation and there's forgiveness. There's unity in the spirit. You can feel it, and true worship can, be, can, be, can take place in that door. That's what he's saying. Psalm 66, 18 says this, If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Our actions, our church attendance, 
our Sunday school attendance, our doing good deeds. God says they don't matter if we have anger in our hearts toward other Christians or other relationships. We have to swiftly correct it or we'll, our worship will be hindered. When my children get angry, they do get angry at each other from every now and then, you know. I guess the more people you put in the house, the more chances you have to get angry with someone. And I know if I let that anger build and they start screaming and they start yelling at each other, if I don't step in and swiftly correct it, what's going to happen? It's just going to get worse. And it's going to get worse. And somebody is going to throw a punch or push or kick or bite, right? Making a list of people to bite, right? It's going to happen if I don't step in. And that's what happens with anger in our lives. We don't correct it. It gets worse and it gets worse and we get more angry and we get more angry until something breaks. That's what he's saying. It must be corrected or it brings more anger. How do we correct it? Well, if you're not in the word on a daily basis, it's going to be hard. If you're not in praying on a daily basis, it's going to be hard. If you don't have someone to talk to about it, it's going to be hard. But you've got to make the steps, the basic steps to correct it before you can even do that. Third, finally, anger must be quickly settled. Quickly settled settled verse 25 this is an interesting passage too he says come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison truly i say to you you will never get out until you have paid your last penny now this these two verses here are essentially a commentary on the previous ones and what it means is he's giving kind of an illustration of what he's talking about he says it was a common practice. If you, owed money, if you owed someone debt and you couldn't pay it back, the common practice was to put them in jail. Right? So I guess if we had that rule here, most everybody would be in jail. I don't know how that works, right? But if you owed a friend $1,000 and you didn't pay him back, then he would just take you to jail. And the, court, uh, the judge would take you to the guard and the guard would lock him up. And then you would stay in there until you paid back every last penny. Jesus says it's the same way if someone has something against you. Now, this is a fascinating thing. He's not saying if you've sinned against someone, go and ask forgiveness. He's saying if you think that you know that someone has something against you, then go to them. That is not how my mind works. What about you? He's not just saying if you know you've sinned against someone before you go worship, he says, you know, just, just go and work out. He says, if you think, maybe if the Lord brings something in your spirit and you think, you know what, that person might have an issue with me, you know, and, and you think that for some reason the spirit is saying, you need to go and search them out. Now, it may be that they have no problem, but he says, go do it because if not, they have imprisoned you in their mind. And you're not getting out until you've paid every last cent. That's a strong teaching Jesus gives us, is it not? It puts us in a place of vulnerability. It puts us in a place of dependence on him. I don't want to go and ask some person if they have a problem against me. But I think we know when that's the case. I think we know when that's the case. This is what Jesus is saying. They will not release you from their mental prison until you have paid whatever they feel like you need to pay them. There's someone you have anger with that has anger against you. Jesus says it needs to be settled. Look at Ephesians 4.26. Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. So th- you can be angry and not bring it into sin, but it's difficult. He says, do not let the sun go down in your anger. Now, if you're married or have children, you know this feeling. You know this feeling to, to have an argument with your spouse or even as your children get older, to, to be at odds with them. Just, you know, a few months ago, I had an issue with one of my children, and my wife said, all right, now before you go to bed, you go in there and make it right. I said, I'm not going to make it right. They're going to make it right. But you know, she's right, right? You know, go in there and make it right before you go to bed. You know what it's like for the sun to go down in your anger and not attempt restitution. It doesn't feel good. That's what he says. It needs to be settled or it'll get worse. And it'll continue to breed. And then also, we don't need to ever take it into our own hands. Look at Romans 12, 19. 
Paul says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, a lot of people read this, and they'll be like, okay, great. I'm just going to be nice and nice and nice, and they're going to get burning coals heaped on their head. That's what we think when we read that, right? Maybe it's just me. I don't know, right? And so what happens is we're nice to them, and we're nice to them, waiting for the burning coals to be heaped on their head. But then what happens is we start loving them again. We start wanting to be nice to them. And that feeling goes away. This is what Jesus is getting at. This is what we need to know about God, though. If someone has sinned against you, and we'll mention this in a few weeks when we talk about retaliation here, too. But when someone has sinned against you, you need to know that God will deal with them more fairly, more justly than you ever can. That doesn't mean that, he'll, that they'll get out easy. It may mean that the consequences of God dealing with them are far worse than you just spouting off on them. So you need to pray for them. That's what you need to do. Because God is a much more just God than we are, ever are. That's a good thing, and that can be a terrifying thing. That's why he says, leave it to me. I'm God. I will repay. Leave it to him this saves you from sinning more it saves you from unforgiveness it saves you from anger and it allows god to be god did you know that you're not god i'm not god either you're not the judge you're not the jury and you're not the executioner let god be god we can do all these things though we can we can acknowledge our anger we can correct our anger we can try to settle our anger but if there's one big if we can only do this if we ask the spirit of god to help us lord help me understand my anger issues help me settle this lord give me the desire to deal with this to correct it and it's easier to ask the spirit to help again when we're in their word when we're in prayer and he will help us So as we close today, maybe God has put someone on your mind today. Someone you've murdered with your words. Someone that you have in a mental prison. God says, release them. Let me be the judge. Let me be the God. And you, instead, defeat the anger in your life. Heavenly Father, as we close our time of worship today, Lord, all of us in here probably right now can think of someone recently or whenever we've been angry with. Or maybe someone we feel like is angry with us. You plead us, Lord, to be reconciled so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. That we can have a peace that passes all understanding. So, Lord, for those of us in here who have been convicted by this message, we ask for your grace that you give us, Lord. We ask for the mercy that you give us and for your forgiveness and for your empowerment, Lord, to do what you've asked us to do. We cannot do this on our own, on our own power. We must depend on you. So, Lord, we ask that today. Father, if there's one in here that's never, ever received salvation, they've never experienced what it means to be forgiven of their sins, to know your love, what you've done for them on the cross, how you took the righteous and just anger of God on the cross, the punishment for our sins that we deserve, that Christ took it on the cross, so that all of us, may find eternal life and salvation. We all can be made right with God through the blood that Jesus spilled. So, Father, that is our prayer today. Lord, search our hearts as we close this worship time. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
band's going to play, and as they play, you stand and ask the Lord to search your heart today.